In the next few videos, we learn about different aspects of random finite sets, including how to describe distributions over sets and how to perform integration when the variable itself is a set. In this video, we begin this small journey by introducing random finite sets as a new type of random variable and discuss their basic properties. Starting from the beginning, a random finite set is a random variable whose possible outcomes are sets with a finite number of unique elements. That is, if you generate samples from a random finite set, you obtain sets, and these sets always have a finite number of elements, and the elements are also unique. We note that both the number of elements in the random finite set, or RFS for short, and the elements themselves are usually random. For instance, if the RFS boldface x contains the vectors x1 to xn, then both the number of elements n and the vectors x1 to xn are random. Note that the measurement matrices also had a similar property in the earlier parts of this course. By the way, we normally use superscripts to index elements of a set and subscripts when we refer to time. To describe this slightly more formally, the elements of the random finite sets are assumed to belong to some space that we denote capital D, where capital D is usually a Euclidean space of some dimension, which means that the elements are just vectors. Of course, the space capital D is not the same for all random finite sets. For instance, if the elements represent object states, D would be a Euclidean space of dimension nx, where nx is the length of the state vectors. And if the elements in the set represent measurement vectors, capital D would be a Euclidean space of dimension nz, where nz is the length of the measurement vectors. Interestingly, the outcomes of the random finite set itself takes values in a more complicated set, f of d, that contains the set of all finite subsets of d. Let's look at some examples to make this more concrete. We will primarily use random finite sets to model two things, object states and measurements. We use boldface xk to denote an RFS that represents the set of object states at time k. In this case, the elements are normally vectors of length nx. Possible realizations of the RFS x is that it can be an empty set, which means that no objects are present. It can be a set with one vector x1, which means that there is one object present with state x1. It can be a set with two vectors x1 and x2, which means that there are two objects present with states x1 and x2 and so on. Imagine that the posterior distribution is such that we believe that there might be an object around 3, 2 and another object around minus 2, minus 1, but that we are uncertain about the presence of both objects. In that case, the following could be possible realizations of the set of objects. As you can see, the set sometimes contains two vectors and sometimes one, and the vectors appear in the regions where we suspected that there may be objects. This is an illustration of what we have in mind when we say that both the number of elements and the elements themselves are random. We also model the measurements as random finite sets, and we use boldface z with subindex k to denote the set of measurements at time k. In this case, the elements of zk are normally vectors of length nz. Here are a few possible realizations. If we do not observe any measurements, the set of measurements is empty. If we observe a single measurement, z1, the set of measurements, boldface z, contains a single vector, z1. If we observe two measurement vectors, z1 and z2, the set of measurements contains two elements, z1 and z2. Suppose now that there are two objects present, and that each object is detected with some probability pd, and that they then generate one detection around 3, 2 and minus 2, minus 1, respectively. Apart from those two potential detections, we also observe a set of clutter measurements, which is a Poisson point process. As illustrated here, the set of observed measurements is the union of these sets. As you can see, for most of the 10 realizations that we've illustrated, we obtain one detection close to 3,2 and another detection around minus 2, minus 1, as well as a few other detections. We have initialized the discussion about sets under the assumption that you're already familiar with sets. 
To make sure that we're all on the same page, let us review some of the basic properties of sets. First of all, two sets are equal if they contain the same elements. A consequence of this is that they are invariant to how the elements in the set are ordered. For instance, it holds that a set with the elements 1, 2, and 3 is the same as a set with the elements 2, 1, and 3. It generally holds that sets do not distinguish between repeated elements. For random finite sets, it holds that their realizations never contain repeated elements. That is, random finite sets always contain one instance of every element, and it would never contain, say, two Bs. We refer to sets that do not contain any elements as empty, and we usually denote them using this symbol. The union of two sets, A and B, is the set of all elements that are in A or B, and is denoted as follows. For instance, if A contains 1 and 2, whereas B contains 2 and 3, the union of A and B contains the elements 1, 2, and 3. The intersection of two sets, A and B, is the set of all elements that are in both A and B, and is denoted as follows. As an example, if A contains 1 and 2, whereas B contains 2 and 3, the intersection between the two sets is a set that only contains the element 2. Many of the sets that we study are assumed to be disjoint, which means that they do not share any elements. Another way to state this is that their intersection is an empty set. Finally, the cardinality of a set A is denoted using one bar on each side of the set A. For finite sets, the cardinality is simply the number of unique elements in the set. For instance, if A contains three elements, four, five, and six, the cardinality of A is three. Note that we previously used an analogous notation for matrices.